and kind of by default, um, I've learned about some of the cephalopods, which is in the phylum mollusca. Uh, they're a special class of animals, uh, and I'll be showing you some of the characteristics of them in just a moment. One career was started on by, by this comic book first page that I have here, um, and I'll explain later that this isn't too far off. Uh, these guys really are monsters in the ocean. They're also shy, and they're fairly interesting. Not not very much is really known about these animals in terms of their behavior, their habitats, or their uh, research attributes. I'll be predominantly talking about octopus, squid, cuttlefish, and the nautilus. <clears throat> we can culture, uh, or we do culture right now as a national resource, both squid and cuttlefish. The species predominantly we'll be talking about today for the octopus is bimaculoides. The squid is Sepio toothus, Lesioniana, definitely is a tongue twister. Um, the common cuttlefish is called Sepia officinalis, and the nautilus is Nautilus pompilius. This is the mudflat or two spotted octopus. Let me show some of the um, features here that may not be readily apparent. This is the epithelium, and all of the covering is a microvillus, very delicate, yet very specialized epithelium. Um, this is the eye, and between the eye, these animals have a fairly complex brain. They have at least seven or eight distinct lobes. Um, they have, they say, not by my standards, but in National Ge Geographic, their intelligence is to the level of a cat. I'm sure some people would, would argue that, but they are fairly intelligent animals. Um, this is an excretory siphon. Water comes in. There's like a sit slit here, passes through their gills, which are in this sac, as well as their other organs. Their, most of their organ systems in here, within the sac, the brain's here, and here's the, here's the eye. And then, the water is excreted out that tube or funnel. This is the, the cuttlefish, and they will have different colors due to a chromatophore system. All these animals, except the nautilus, have chromatophores. They're a specialized organ that have nerve, muscle, and granules, and they also have receptors, neuroendocrine receptors, that can change instantaneously. This animal can change. Uh, if you come up to the tank, um, they will change their colors in an escape. If you persist or you um, harass these animals, they will ink the tank immediately, so you won't be able to see anything. So they're very unusual animals. This is another view. This is a male cuttlefish. This is the arm. The males have very distinct markings. Females do not. This ridge here is the main uh, mechanism which they swim. They can swim in any direction. They can move lateral. They can move horizontal. They're kind of like a spaceship. They can move just about any way you can imagine. Um, these are tentacles here. And I'll show you the mouth parts in a second. Uh, we do identify these animals versus a tag. They accept the tag very well. And there's, here again, from the first slide, there's quite a bit of variation in color in these animals. The 
This is the Nautilus. <coughs> this is um, a little bit different than the rest of them. And I don't have a picture of a squid. I think most people, uh, I've got a couple pictures coming up under the disease portion of the squid, but I don't have one just as, as a normal. Um, these animals don't have a chromatophore system, but they do have pigmentation. This is the hood area, and this is the shell. Um, you probably have oftentimes seen these in some of the shell stores where they split this shell longitudinally and there's chambers within uh, that spiral and they're very beautiful shell. Their eye is different than the rest of the cephalopods in that it is a pinhole type camera eye. There's, this communicates with the environment. Um, the other cephalopods have lens and cornea. They have three pairs of tentacles, uh, pre and post orbital, 19 digital tentacles, and then several buccal tentacles. The difference between the tentacles of the Nautilus and the rest of the cephalopods is they do not have suckers. Uh, they do produce a glycocalyx, uh, which attaches, uh, which they attach to grids or the coral reef, depending on where they're located. Um, let me talk about availability. Um, we get our um, octopuses from uh, a wide vari variation, uh, Pacific, North Pacific, South Pacific. We can get them from a gulf. Octopuses aren't that hard to, to acquire. They're a little bit difficult to actually physically get, but they're usually in uh, cans or underneath rocks, so various people collect them. The the giant squid, or the big fin reef squid, we collect in casings in the Sea of Japan, and we fly them to our aquarium. and we, we have a mariculture of those. Cuttlefish are usually in, in the Mediterranean, Italy and France, and um, we have several generations of those. We can raise those from adults through eggs through adults again. Nautilus are somewhat narrow-banded in range. Um, they're in warm waters of the Indian Ocean to Australia, in Samoa, and the Philippines. Uh, this animal uh, had come from the Philippines. Another view. Here's some of the differences between the Nautilus and the other cephalopods. They do have a shell, and it's used for protection. It also is used for buoyancy. They have a, a diel rhythm where at sunrise, they'll go to 300 meters or so, and sunset, they'll come up from that to 100 meters. They don't have chromo chromatophores, and as I pointed out, they do not have the normal eye. What they do have is large olfactory receptors. Uh, these animals, are used predominantly for chemoreceptors. They don't move very well, um, but they gather their prey. They're smellers and gatherers rather than they're spotters and attackers. Um, these animals do not have an ink sac, and they, they live longer than the rest of the cephalopods. Most of the other animals live one to two years, occasionally three or four. Um, the other ones grow very fast. These grow very slow. So there's some differences in this group of animals. All of the animals have a beak, anterior and posterior uh, beaks. And right here, this is called a radula, it's a tongue. What the octopus do and the other cephalopods except the nautilus is uh, they grab their prey, usually it's a shelled organism, and they start vibrating the radula. After they breach a hole in the shell, they secrete a toxin in there which kills their prey. So these animals, I mean, nothing can really escape them if it's shelled. These are very, um, they have a very heavy armamentarium. In the octopus, again, here's the eye. You have these anterior salivary glands, which do contain a toxin. The mandible, and it's a fairly, they have a crop gizzard, or not a gizzard, but esophagus. They do have a crop, stomach, and what's kind of unique is this spiral cecum. 
So when you start looking at these histologically, you have to um, spend some time. It's not real easy at first, but you can acquire some skills after looking at several of these. So there is a learning curve. I'll talk to you a little bit, talk a little bit addressing uh, most of these animals are used in neurobiology um, throughout the country, uh, mostly the nervous system and chemical transmitters. Um, they don't have red blood cells, but what they have is a uh, ceruloplasm. They do have amoebocytes, so the immune system is looked at uh, quite frequently. Their ocular physiology is a little bit different than the mammalian species. The 10 layers of the, uh, which involves the retina in the, in the, uh, the rat, say a rat or mouse, well, the uh, sensory ganglia are up front. They're very first layer versus the 10th layer. So they're very uh, unusual in their uh, eye physiology. Uh, the Nautilus is used in uh, the hair, uh, they have hair receptors for uh, control of uh, writing itself and they, they call this model of angular acceleration and they look at that. They also look, at, they're still investigating the chromatophore system and they look at some of these animals for aging. Calmodulin, they also have uh, the cuttlefish as an animal model for uh, endocarditis and vibrio uh, and a few other bacteria that they can um, experimentally induce of uh, endocarditis. I have been uh, fairly successful with just regular 10% buffer nu neutral formalin. We have used Davidson fixative. Um, we've also used just 90% ethanol alcohol. Um, I've used alcoholic formalin. The only thing that I've known uh, with 10% buffer neutral formalin is sometimes if you mix some of the salt water uh, in there, it'll precipitate out, but it, you, it doesn't have any ill effects as far as I'm concerned. What some of the people do, the biologists there, sometimes they'll make a 5% formalin seawater mixture and put some marble chips to, as a buffer stabilizing agent, and then we'll bring it to our lab, and that's been fairly satisfactory. Uh, as far as processing the tissues, we basically use um, a very rapid uh, 15 to 20 minute cycle on most of the cycles going through dehydration and rehydration. We don't use any heat. Occasionally we use a vacuum uh, and the tissues are cut at four to six microns and uh, they do quite well. I'd like to take you through some steps on, this is a small cuttlefish uh, that I'd like to show you how we've developed a little um, procedure that works pretty easy for uh, necropsy. This is the uh, a position where this animal would be uh, in the water normally. Here are the eyes, tentacles, and the mouth is in the back. We will flip him over and make a midline incision down the midline. Here's a siphon, and you can barely see the mouth right here. A little higher magnification. There's the oral cavity here, with, and there's a beak, two beaks from inside that. Midline incision. Okay, back up one. And you can see we reflect the muscle tissue and the skin back, and we have one gill here, intestinal organs, there's a rectum here, and there's spiral cecums up here. One. Uh, point of interest, this is an ink sac. If you nick that, it'll be a mess. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's like pouring a bottle of Indy ink uh, out into your surface. So you'll have to, it's a silver bag and inside that lining is uh, a lot of black material. Uh, this is fully exposed. And you could take this, put it in formalin and then take it out. Now the top side, you uh, still have a cuddle bone. That's of commercial value. All these animals are of commercial value one way or another, um, either for food or for, um, in, the, in this case, the, the cuddle bones used for some of the um, budgerie jars and some of the other animals for a perching uh, uh, material and nutritional value. But if you slip a, 
Number 10, Bart Parker blade underneath that and peel it off. There's a cut -a bone right here. And take the edge again, you can remove the cuddle bone off, make an incision here and here, and you basically have all the parts you need. And then you could step section, starting from the, um, I call this anterior to posterior, and you could see all the organs uh, of this animal. This is the um, hepatopancreas or midgut gland. It's a fairly large organ and it's very important for uh, histological evaluation. Let me start with the octopus. Um, I have one disease that I know occurs in the wild, one or two. Uh, most of the other diseases will be reflected in culture or um, artificially raised um, containers, so they may not reflect what really happens in the wild. Occasionally, uh, these animals will uh, get nicked, and these are ulcers. Uh, almost all the time, there'll be a, you know, a fatal septicemia associated with these. Here's uh, another octopus, large ulcerative lesions. They will get usually infected. We've cultured 22 different strains of Vibrio. They're probably opportunists, but they will become septicemic. Uh, no matter what we treat them with, usually they, they wind up uh, dying. So it's really important to have uh, non-sharp or uh, any obstacles in the tanks that will cause breach of their membranes. Their skin's very important. This is an animal that was brought in. It's caught in the wild, and they can heal. Most of the um, false eye or a chelus, just as a better picture, uh, they can, that can change colors too. And anybody gives you the evil eye, you can say, well, I saw one a couple weeks ago at a conference. So there it is. There uh, is a problem with all these animals that uh, in captivity, I think they, they have corneal opacities. And in some respects, they have um, cataracts. Uh, they've been cultured extensively. We've gotten some Vibrio out, but I think most times it's either a genetic thing or something with the water quality. I don't think it's an infectious process. But I think there'll be a paper coming out that this is probably a non-infectious process or entity that's associated with culture of the cephalopods. Okay. This animal is presented to me with raised multi-vesicles, one to four millimeters, both on the, the hood area and on the tentacle. I had no idea what this was, so we sectioned it. And within these cyst walls are numerous Sporocysts, the epithelium is very delicate. Here's the epithelium. This is beneath the, uh, this is in the dermis or subcutis almost. Higher magnification will show numerous. Yeah. Sporocysts, and these are sporozoites. I uh, showed you the skin because that's really not been reported before. Um, you could t about 65% of the Northern Pacific octopus have this disease. It's the um, coccidian of the apico-complexin group. It's called aggregata species. And th these will infiltrate uh, the gastrointestinal tract. Um, a normal animal have these, usually you don't have any inflammation unless they breach this membrane and then you'll have inflammation. But of the ones that I've seen, there was no inflammation associated with this. Uh, I looked at an animal from the Toronto Aquarium and it was throughout the gills. So uh, I, this, an, this organism can be virtually anywhere, but most of the time they'll be in the intestinal tract. And it'll be in different forms. These are sporoblasts, which will develop into sporocysts and contain sporozoites. 
This is a macro gamant, macro gamant, excuse me, large nucleus. And this will throw you, look like you'll have two different organisms uh, going on, but it's the same syndrome. This has been reported in uh, the early 20s. And um, you need a crustacean. You need a crab to go through the cycle. It's a crab cephalopod cycle. Some animals, when they come in, at least with octopus, they, like other animals, they get stressed. And I believe uh, this is a ulceration with a nice inflammatory response. This is a spiral cecum. So it looks quite a bit different than the mammalian species. This is a gastric or cecal ulcer. And here again, usually the septicemia that ensues, various bacteria will uh, usually demise the animal. They'll go off feed, and then they'll, they'll uh, pass away within a day or so. This is another situation in octopus and some of the cuttlefish. You'll see these organisms. And uh, our preliminary data is that Rather than their degenerating cells, um, they have organelles similar to uh, the amoeba, but we have uh, failed to uh, culture these organisms. They don't appear to be, uh, have any problems. This is a squid. Most of the problems, squids, the squid group in general has been very healthy, and most of the things we'll see disease entities will be with the eye. This is an ulcerated cornea right here, corneal ulcer. And this is um, opacity, a lens opacity. Um, this is a cuttlefish, and you'll see lens opacities and a cataract in some of these animals. The frequency is not very high, but in 100 animals, you'll, you'll see at least 2%, 2 to 3% develop some of the eye problems. This is normal. This is a cloudy cornea. And then these raised areas, this is a retired breeder. And I guess uh, some of these animals um, will be in an area where the uh, bubbles come up, and they'll get them trapped. They'll get these bubbles trapped under their skin. They'll try to force them out cause an ulcer, and uh, that'll be another problem down the line. This is a large ulceration. How it was induced, uh, we don't know. We, they don't handle these animals very much because most of these are used on behavioral studies. But uh, it will result in death of the animal, large ulcers. Talk about another syndrome where uh, these animals are fed usually live or freshly killed or fresh frozen fish. And um, they fed these animals um, a group of fish from the scombird family. Includes the mackerel, tuna. Um, this is a North Atlantic bumper fish. And these were uh, thawed out on the dock for about two or three hours. Uh, this, is chloro this is a chloroscombus group. And shortly after the cuttlefish were fed, the animals started um, eliciting <coughs> um, strange swimming movements. And then within two hours, all of them were dead. About 25 or 30 were in the tank. I looked at the um, pancreas. It's friable, light tan, and on cut section, you could see some fractures in this organ. And this organ is different than the male man counterpart, or even in fish. Um, it's tubular or tubular sinus, and they have these um, granular appearance. Can't make out the cytoplasm all that well. Here's a higher magnification, but at least you could see some stromal structures, some background, some vessels. Here again, these organs. These might be degenerating cells. 
In the case after feeding the uh, scombrid, large areas were necrotic. And there was an inflammatory response. These are amoebocytes. Looks like they're undergoing mitotic division here too, are surrounding some of those necrotic areas. Some of them lasted, um, some of the animals lived longer than two hours. I was kind of surprised they monitored an inflammatory response. Here again, uh, what may have killed them again, these animals had uh, bacteria within those necrotic area. It has been reported that the, um, <coughs> this group, Scombrid, uh, Back, certain bacteria grow within the, the flesh of these fish and convert histidine to histamine and so there's massive quantities of histamine that are released and when people eat these fish they get um, uh, high pulse uh, flushing um, and there's pretty good evidence that uh, the, the most common ichthyotoxicosis is scombroid poisoning and for a long time they really couldn't prove that until they started giving people some antihistamines and they would clear up. But this is just kind of anecdotal evidence and there may be other factors or ever other chemicals within these fish that uh, causes syndrome. Occasional, we'll see a cuddle bone that's deformed and they won't grow, the, the animals aren't uh, growing right. Um, I have no idea what the cause of this and there's still a lot of investigation to do yet on our, our animals. Next, I'd like to talk to you a little bit about uh, pigmentation, the hood of the nautilus. Um, had an opportunity, the animal started uh, losing weight and there was a large area on the hood that was just debit of all pigment. And um, this investigator also let me know, had let me know that uh, there was a report in Hawaii from the aquarium that there was a syndrome um, also like this. So let's follow up. Here again, this is Nautilus. This is the pigment and epithelium on the hood. This is pigment and also, but not to the same extent. Notice that it's high columnar, sometimes it's pseudostratified. This is very tall, it's got a uh, microvillus edge. It also has a nice uh, mucus coating. There's multiple cell types. Some, are, some have been reported mucus and epithelial. And there's another type that's got granular material in it that uh, it is unknown as far as what the granules are at this time. It's a higher magnification. And there's a nice coating of mucus. This is the area where at the very edge of the lesion there was no epithelium. And as we sectioned this further, uh, we could see there was uh, uh, quite a bit of an inflammatory response uh, within the, the uh, dermis and subcutis. We noted that there was debris within little circular areas, fairly deep to the epithelium. There's debris and uh, inflammatory response. Well, I felt there was an organism there. I couldn't find anything with just H and E. So we stained it with a Grocotts silver stain and there's a branching septate organism. Um, on Fontana Mason, it was non-pigmented and we contacted um, uh, one of the mycologists that we knew in New York State Lab and um, he had some immunoreagents, so we did a, a direct fluorescent antibody. It's higher magnification of the Grocotts. There it is. And decided it was in the uh, fungi imperfecta, and this is the canidia. I'm trying. Against Fusaria species. And this is the hyphal elements here. So that's not to say that all the uh, cases may have been diffusaria, but at least in this case, 
Fusaria uh, did play a fairly significant part on the um, ulcerative dermatitis that we found. And also it was kind of interesting that in within those tissues, there were, it was deep inside that hood area of the Nautilus. And I wanted to thank these people for giving me some slides or some coaching. Uh, there's still a lot to be done with these uh, animals and there's still a lot to be known. As far as other entities such as viruses, there was a few reports that there was an adeno-like virus, but no one's established any cell lines and to this date, we haven't been able to culture any viruses out of these organisms. So as far as some of the diseases that are out in the wild, we still have to do quite a bit of work. We have maintained a, a culture and for some more information, I have two references for you about the culture of these animals. And the, uh, the most well known, I guess, is the giant, or the, the large squid, and that's known for the giant axon preparations that a lot of the neurobiologists use. And that's all I have right now, and I'd like to entertain any questions. Yes, it's like a parrot biting you. You know, it's not very fun. But most of the octopus and the uh, uh, cuttlefish and the squid, those particular species are usually not aggressive. And we've got a little bay squid that will attach their suckers and they won't let up and it does hurt. It, it, will, it will make you bleed, it'll draw blood, so. I don't know anything about these animals, but uh, I don't know much more. Osmoregulatory, are they passive or are they active? Uh, osmoregulatory and osmoregulation, does, does that affect your fixing in terms of what you have to use as far as osmoregulatory? Uh, what I've known is there's a protein precipitate, but it, it doesn't really affect the uh, tissues that much from what I could see. I've tried Boone's, but I don't like it because of the picric acid. And uh, like I said, most of the time, 10% buffer neutral formula is okay. Alcoholic formula is okay, but you have to get it out of the alcohol. Uh, what you're trying to say, I understand what you say, but I haven't had any um, uh, artifacts as far as cell swelling or, or disruption. So, they, so what is there? Do they, are they passive? I don't know about it. Well, they're in a marine environment, so I think they have to actively pump out uh, the salts. Some. Yeah, they have some. They have some uh, gland, and I can't remember what the name was. That that's actively regulating their uh, internal, uh, uh, you know, osmotic fluid. They don't have red cells, but they do have, you know, lymph-like or fluid ceruloplasm. So it would be active in this in this case. I, I would assume if it was more if they had an osmotic. If, some species, I don't know, had uh, osmolarity that was clear, it was closer to seawater, you'd have to use a fixity when they had any, uh, but if these are more like most fishes are. Yeah, I haven't any problems with our fixes, and I usually keep, keep it around neutral, and yeah, it's probably, I think our milliosmoles on uh, formula is like 320, and I, and I don't know what it is in the tank, so. What are, is there any, Unusual, or how do you recognize in, in section the uh, inflammatory cells, the amebocytes, I think you call it, right? How do you recognize them? I mean, what is, a, is there anything? When I looked at those pictures, I saw some large cells, some very small ones, and I just, but they all look, look like a very mixed inflammatory reaction. Yeah, they're. I, didn't, I didn't know what I was looking at. I was looking at a bunch of nuclei. I think. Right. Um, they do. How can I say, compared to a mammalian cell, they're, they appear a little bigger than a neutrophil, but not as, quite as big as a macrophage most times. But in that one inflammatory lesion, it was the, the one real good one I had. They had cells that were fairly large, but I think they were undergoing mitosis. So, you know, I don't know how to answer that. Other than that, they're larger than a neutrophil and, and probably a little smaller than a macrophage. Um, on some of the, the diseases, they just don't have a very good inflammatory response. And you have to differentiate too. Um, one thing good about us that I've 
tried to work with the myologists is to try to get them informal and as fast as they, they can, because then you'll have to deal with it as a, you know, a post-mortem change or not, you know, when you see some of those bacteria. And the bacteria that we, we I can't pinpoint any bacteria other than that. Um, salt water contains, and I don't know if this has been pointed out, about 20 times more the capacity for bacteria than fresh water. So most of the bacterial infections are going to be opportunistic. They've cultured Pseudomonas, Vibrio, and just about anything else. But once you breach the membrane or you damage an organ, um, they don't have a very good immune response afterwards. Somebody else had their hand up here. Um, just as my question, all the cuttlefish that I've ever had an experience with have developed lesions in what you call the posterior end. And they did this by braiding themselves on the glass in relatively small enclosures. Do you have any, have you had an experience like that? They, well, yeah, if you start closing them in, they will braid themselves. But what, what they have used is these large plastic raceways and, and or cattle uh, drinking troughs that are adapted, and they have a fairly sophisticated um, computerized um, operation where there's one central uh, filtration uh, unit that serves many large tanks. Some of them are up in excess of 8,000 liters. You mentioned how sensitive they were to uh, uh, septic infection once the uh, epidermis had been breached, and the ones that I know of seem to maintain themselves fairly well uh, and, and develop scarring even after uh, something like this has occurred. That's just our, that's my experience and uh, you have to be careful on what kind of drugs you use because the, the, um, the epithelium acts, since it has such a large surface area, also um, acts like a topical agent. So um, you, we have to cut down the dosage. They'll put a dip tank in and uh, I think they use chlorophenicol, but the way they deliver it is putting it in shrimp first and then, and then the, the cuttlefish will eat the shrimp and get medicated. Uh, anything you put in the water, iodine or anything like that, will have a profound effect on the animals. I just mentioned, if people aren't aware, there's a study section set on the uh, cuttlefish AFIP that Dick Montali's group put together with the glass slides. And just commenting on that, we used to call it butt bruising or whatever. If it goes to the cuddle bone, and if the inflammation and infection gets into the cuddle bone, we don't have much luck with it clinically. But if it's superficial and the epithelial tissues, then, then you can treat it pretty well. What's your method for euthanasia? We found that, um, <clears throat> well, an octopus, I could tell you what I did. I, uh, 10% ethanol works pretty well. And then I just, uh, uh, as far as immobilizing the animal, and I just uh, dislocate it uh, up by the brain region and just start fixing it. But most of the ones that are presented to us were, you know, uh, had died. Or the other, other way that people have used ice and then dislocated the, the brain region, and that's worked out pretty well too. They're, they're fairly difficult and surprising when you put rubber gloves on. They're extremely slippery. Well, thank you very much.